here uh, this morning just to inform you this right here is not an illusion okay this is a bow tie it's all right uh, given the circumstances of the day uh, our brother Craig I think would really appreciate the bow tie so that's why uh, I'm wearing it if you have your Bible with you please go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 um, this morning we're going to talk about uh, a word uh, that all of us want, uh, everybody in the world, for as far as I know, wants this, uh, but it is also so hard to have, to get, to obtain. Uh, it's something that uh, state uh, governments focus on, it's something that local governments focus on, it's something that world governments focus on. It's something that is both external, they can be seen externally, but also can take place internally. And the word that we're going to be talking about this morning is peace. Peace, everybody wants it. Yet as we look and we survey the world, we, and as the stats show and as surveys show, more and more people are increasingly answering the question about, do you have peace with the answer, no. Or, I wish that I had it, but it seems like it's something out there that's just so hard to grasp. It's that imaginary uh, brass ring, so to speak, that if I could just get to it, and if I could just obtain it, that everything would be okay. And this is a concept, this is something that the world and the culture thrives on. Because how do you think the culture sells you all the stuff that you have? I mean, how many people walked in to Dick's Sporting Goods on January 1 and said, I'll have the $3,000 treadmill, please? How many people showed up at Planet Fitness down here on New Hope Road on January 1, 2, and 3 saying, Ha, huh, if I can just get to the gym, I can have peace. Or how many people back in 2008, 2009, 2010 invested in gold after the stock market collapsed? Because the commercial said, if you invest in gold when the economy collapses, you can have financial Peace. Anybody seen the tally of Bitcoin lately? Yeah, I know you have, right? Bitcoin is skyrocketing in the amount of people that are investing in that because in case 2008 happens again, you can find peace and security in cyber money. We hear all the time, young people say, man, if I just can have A, B, C, or D, or, or if I could just be, you know, like Steph Curry, if I could just be like this actor or this actress, then I know if I had X amount of dollars, I could have peace. And know what's ironic about all of that stuff is that more often than not, when people lose those 20 or 30 pounds, or when people gain X amount of dollars, or when people have a number of YouTube hits, or people buy this uh, outrageously large amounts of gold, you know what they still don't have? Peace. And why is that? Because the way that the culture is set up, the way that it's structured is that there's always more, more Bitcoin you can invest in. There's always a bigger house that you can buy. There's always another pound that you can lose because after all, there's always another size that you need to fit into. And after all, there's always more money to make. There's another video to shoot to get more hits on YouTube. There are more followers to be gained on Facebook and Twitter. There are more Instagram photos to put up. There are more people to make your friends. And in all of that, we chase this thing called peace from a purely physical position. And know who benefits from that? 
Surely the culture benefits from it because then as you continue down the road and as you continue to chase peace through physical, primarily physical and material means, the culture benefits from that because you and I become a statistic. Whether a good statistic or bad statistic, we can, you know, we add to the number of people who are now on Twitter, we add to the statistic of the number of people who are now are on Facebook, we add to the statistic of number of people who go to the gym January 1 and are out of the gym by January 15. We add to the number of people the statistic of how many returns on treadmills Dick Sporting Goods gets between January and February. And we still strive and we still struggle and we still feel that inner turmoil, the, the inner uh, voice within us that says, man, I don't know how to get to this thing where I can settle in, where I can anchor in on this thing called peace. Internationally, it's the same way. How many times in your lifetime have you heard a presidential candidate stand up in front of people and say, one of my international policy goals is to bring peace peace to the Middle East. And yet for some reason, president, presidential candidate after presidential candidate comes and they go and we still, no peace. And this morning as we begin 2018 and as we focus in on the family, both the physical and the spiritual family, it would behoove us to note what real peace looks like. And here's the thing about all of that we've said so far, is that you're not the only people that have ever struggled with this idea of trying to find peace in a crazy, tumultuous, scary world. Because there were a group of people in Rome, the center of the world in the first century, in which Pax Romana was spread across multiple countries and multiple continents to the point where Rome was the modern day United States of America, so to speak, in terms of political and military power. And you had these group of people who came together who denied what the culture was saying with regards to the participation in worship of multiple gods. They said, no, there's one God. There's a group of people who united under this person named Jesus Christ. And they said, he is divine in a culture where the only person who was allowed to be divine was Caesar. A group of people who came from different backgrounds and associations and jobs in which we were mostly divided between Jews and Gentiles. The Gentiles who had never heard of this idea of a Messiah, but the mystery of the gospel was that they would have a place and a seat in a relationship with the one true God. And the Jewish people who who claimed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as they looked century after century, decade after decade, for this person who would be the Messiah, who would restore and who would save Israel. And they realized that on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so you get these people and you have this culture and what you see is that while the culture of Rome was very peaceful, Pax Romana as peace spread, quote, peace spread across the globe through the domination of Rome, what you had was the terms of peace in Rome. Number one, that nobody claimed to be king other than Caesar. Number two, everybody fell in line with the customs and cultures of Rome. And if you were a Christian in the first century, that was definitely not terms of peace that you could meet. Because your allegiance was to the one true king, the king whose kingdom was not made by physical barriers, but by the infiltration of the minds and hearts of mankind. And to call another one king would be 
to betray the one true king in Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, you have people who are, are struggling in the Roman church because after all, there is this great chasm between Jew and Gentile as most of us have heard about probably ad nauseum as we've grown up in the church. But it is a serious issue. And so throughout the the book of Romans, Paul addresses this idea that the gospel is for all people for all time. And how can that be is the question that the Jews and Gentiles are asking. For one side says we were grafted in and the gospel was so that we, the Gentiles, might have this place at the table. And the Jews would say, actually, no, the gospel's for us because after all, our lineage leans all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, in Jacob. And if there's one thing that wasn't present in the Roman church, whether it be as they looked externally into the culture or internally into the church, there wasn't this thing called peace. And so Paul, over the course of 16 chapters in your English version, tells them and elaborates on this idea that the gospel and that this Jesus is peace for all people. And in the first six chapters of the book of Romans, Paul lays out the theology behind the gospel this idea that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that both, both Jew and Gentile would stand before God and without the cleansing power of Jesus Christ's blood would stand before God and face his wrath. And then from chapter seven to the end of the book, he gives the practical application. But right in the middle there's a very important section that we need to look at. And you've turned to it, hopefully by now, in Romans chapter 5. Because Paul gives us the definition and the outline of what peace looks like for people. And as you can imagine, it's going to center around this person named Jesus Christ. And that he is the peace offering for all people. And so in Romans chapter 5 verse 1, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul lays it out right there this morning. I don't know where or who or what you've been investing your time in to try and find this thing called peace. Only you know that. But what Paul clearly lays out is that Jesus Christ is the peace for all people. It, he is the peace offering that allows you and I in a, in, to become uh, one with him, one in his body, and one with God. And we've obtained this in access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so because of this peace offering as Jesus is, it is not by the works and the, right, the self-righteousness of people that they can come into a relationship with God, but only by the grace of God. Now, what does that mean for the Jew and for the Gentile? For the Jew, it means it doesn't matter who your father is or who your dad was or who your mom was, that the only way that you can stand before God justified is be by God's grace that you can stand before him justified on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean for the Gentile? It also doesn't matter what your lineage is or what your background might be. And think about the way in which peace is attained or, or promoted in the culture. This, in, the, in our culture, peace is promoted as you've got to be a part of some group on the basis of some accomplishment that you in and of yourself can achieve. But that's not what this says. See, the peace for the world 
really amounts to division. Yet the peace of Jesus Christ brings about harmony and unity both externally amongst people but also internally, spiritually. But notice the second thing about this peace. That this peace is not only brings people into a relationship with God, but this peace can endure anything. Notice what it says. He says there in verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice because we have peace. I mean, who wouldn't rejoice uh, when peace takes place? Remember, some of you can remember back uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, when the wall came tumbling down between East and West Germany. And finally, after decades of occupation, of communist rule, both East and West were no longer represented in the Olympics as two separate entities, but they were represented as one full, complete, total entity. Not as East Germany or West Germany, but just as Germany. Because there was peace amongst people. And it's in this peace that brings us into union with one another, that brings us into union with God on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done because he is the peace offering for all people. We can rejoice. This morning, if your life looks like a gloomy cloud and you're a Christian, there's no peace. This morning as we sit here and as I stand here, I hope you walked through the doors and you sat down and your heart was full and that you had the opportunity uh, internally to rejoice in the fact that you were with your brothers and with your sisters and that you were in the presence of God. Because he's provided you with peace this morning. And not only that, we rejoice in our <gasps> suffering. How does, how, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Time out, Paul. See, this is what Paul always does. Paul sets me up, gets me excited, and then he talks about how I can be happy even though I suffer. And how is that? This is why, and this is what he's going to say. One of the reasons that I can be happy and that I can rejoice in the peace that I have in Jesus Christ even though I suffer is because that peace cannot be touched. It cannot be destroyed. As Peter would say, it is, un, it is imperishable. It is undefiled. And it is being guarded by God Almighty. That future peace that interacts with me, not interacts with me, but, but, but controls me, that compels me, even in the here and now. That my soul is saved and that my soul is secure. And in knowing that my soul is saved and that my soul is secure, that there is nothing that can take place in this life that can touch that. Therefore, I can endure the suffering in the times in which life kicks me in the gut. And he notes that this suffering produces endurance and that in this endurance produces character and this character produces hope that this suffering allows me as James would say in James chapter 1 helps me to become a complete a mature a set apart person and that this hope that I long for, that this confident assurance of what is to come, that's the biblical definition of hope, doesn't put me to shame. I don't look at my Christianity and I say, oh shucks, I wish I hadn't done that. Or, oh no, I've got to go interact with those people. Or, man, I'm really scared of what uh, the future might hold. This hope doesn't put me to shame because why? Because what the overarching narrative is, is not what can the world do to me, but it's what God has done for me in that he has poured out his love into my heart through 
the Holy Spirit, on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he is that peace offering. He is the peace for all people. And that peace, as Paul says, can't be touched by what happens with an economy, can't be touched what happens politically, can't be touched by the personal suffering that I endure, can't be touched by the personal losses that I might incur. It isn't based on job performance. It isn't based on a checklist that I, that, I, that I carry out. It isn't based on my greatness or my goodness. It's based upon his greatness and his goodness. But also I rejoice and I have this peace because it allows me to reflect upon who I am and who God is. And what Paul is going to do for the rest of this section from verse 6 to verse 11 is he's going to do a comparison and contrast between who all of us were, both Jew and Gentile, and he's going to compare that to what God has done. See, sometimes the way in which I reconnect with the peace that surpasses all understanding. Sometimes the way in which I reconnect spiritually with Jesus is that I have to take the time to meditate and think and dwell on who I used to be and what God has made me into. And that's exactly what he does in verses 6 through 11. He says, this peace took place while we were still weak. The literal translation of that is helpless. And I can't help but think back to uh, the, the book of Ezekiel in which God recounts his drawing uh, or, or accepting of Israel. He likens Israel to a newborn baby which is out in the open field in which no salt had been rubbed on its skin and that there was nobody there to wash it of its blood and that every other person, every other nation passed by and didn't think anything of Israel. But the good Lord passed by and he saw this baby wallowing in its own blood and in that blood he said, live. And without the Lord, that baby, that nation of Israel is helpless against the forces and the elements of the world. That is the same picture and same description, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. That is us without God. Helpless. To fend off the forces and the elements of the world and culture that seek to draw us deeper and deeper, further and further away from God. And it says there that while we were still weak at the right time, what time? The right time, Christ died for everybody that was perfect. Everybody that had it all put together, everybody that had all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. See, that's the definition of every other religion of the time frame. It says there that Christ died at the right time for the ungodly. Spoiler alert, us. Which means, that word means, that there was no amount of focus on the plan and the desires of God, but it was solely inward focused. That it was so uh, self-righteous, so to speak, against the nature and the purity and the holiness of God. Brothers and sisters, that was us. And he died for us. 
And notice what Paul says. He makes a commentary on the average person in verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person would even dare to die. He goes, you don't really come across a lot of people that are willing to save save somebody else by giving their own life. But maybe a good person might. So he calls the first definition that we were weak and that we were ungodly. That's what we were, but notice what God did and who God is in verse 8. But God showed us his agape, love. Love. For us, in that while we were still, third description, still sinners, while we were still people who continually, day in and day out, missed the mark, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that simply is 100% counterintuitive to the average human experience. Because for all of us, we have a a, a set parameter that I'll do something good for somebody and there's only so many number of times that they can wrong me in which I will still help them. We've all experienced that, whether it's in our own families, whether it's at work, whether it's friends. We've all experienced that at some level. Yet God in his goodness and God in his love, while we continually disgraced his name, while we continually did things outside of his will, while we continually did things that were outside and not concerned with his holiness over and over and over again, he still peered down into the world and he still looked at us and he says, I still want them. How refreshing and reassuring was it when the good Lord looked at Peter in the eyes and said, Peter, tend my flock. Peter, there's going to come a time in which you won't direct your own steps. As the writer says, indicating the type of death that Peter would have. Or how reassuring was it for Paul when he understood that what he had done wrong, yet Jesus himself showed up and had a conversation with him. You think Peter felt any peace in that moment? You think Paul had an overwhelming sense of peace Internally, about what had just taken place on given exactly who he was? And what about us? That moment for those of us who are Christians when you came up out of the water, knowing that in that moment you had placed yourself in the saving arms of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, was there an overwhelming sense of peace? in that moment. And maybe the better question to ask this morning is, is that overwhelming sense of peace still there as we sit here and as I stand here? Because in light of who we were and in light of what God's done, that peace should still be present. It is, as we say, you know, the, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Does that candle, does that light still shine? Does that light still flicker? And notice in verse 9, since therefore, because of who we were and because of what God has done, since therefore we have now been justified by his (gasps) key word, In all of the Bible, blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And I understand that it's not a popular subject to talk about, but whether you want to accept it or not, the wrath of God is an absolutely, positively real biblical doctrine. And there will be those on the day of judgment who experience that. And I don't say that to scare anybody. I say that as a matter 
of truth that's seen in the Bible. And for those who do not have the peace of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is a fearful day. Oh, but the peace that the children of God have in knowing that they will not experience that on the basis of being justified by Christ's blood. You know what that makes all of us as Christians? That makes all of us blood relatives, so to speak. Because those who have placed themselves in the waters of baptism have contacted the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that peace that surpasses all understanding is available to us and should be used by us. And the question this morning, as we look back and we note that Jesus in Wednesday night class is the Passover lamb, is that blood sprinkled on the doorpost of your heart this morning? And it says in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, there's another description, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we are also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now see, received atonement or reconciliation. And so as Paul in this section, he draws both Jew and Gentile back to remember exactly who they were, what they have, and the peace that is available to all. And this isn't in the brain housing group of notes. But I want to ask all of us a very serious question this morning. Are we playing the game? You know, the Christian game. You know, like I, I get up on Sunday and I put my clothes on, my church clothes, right? Because you got your work clothes, you got your school clothes, you got your church clothes. And I come in and I sit down and I'm not present. I don't sing with the fullness of my heart. I give so that people see me give. And as I wake up on Monday morning, nothing internally has really changed in a long time. Maybe since my baptism or maybe since who knows when. And, and, and I go to work and I worry about all the things of the world and I worry about all the things of my job and I worry about all of this other stuff. And I make time for all of this other stuff. And rarely do I dwell on the holiness of God. Rarely do I read uh, about the sacrifice of Jesus. Rarely do I peer into this book to see exactly who I am and what Jesus has done for me. And the last time that I really actually prayed and thanked God for reconciling me and saving me from myself was the moments after my baptism. Actually, maybe the only time I really genuinely pray is when food's on the table. Evangelism is a matter for the elders, deacons, and the preacher. But just as long as I'm there, I feel like I've done enough. See, here's the thing about this section. Is that this section calls us to re-examine and maybe even rededicate ourselves to what it means to appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus. And this section promises, as we've noted over and over again this morning, this section promises an unending, unceasing, unfathomable amount of peace that can only be found in Jesus Christ the Lord who died, was buried, and was raised on the third day. And what these people did 
in, Roman, in the book of Romans is that Paul calls them to forget about where they came from, forget about what they did, forget about all of the things that distracted them from the gospel and get back on mission so that they might not only have the peace that surpasses all understanding, but they might be so countercultural that the culture looks and seeks to know some more about this thing called Christianity. And they did it because they were convinced and they did it because they were convicted and that they did it as we saw this morning because when they suffered they rejoiced to know that they were worthy of the suffering that came upon them because of who they were and what they represented they didn't say things like man I'll talk about my faith when someone asks me about it they said no I'm going to tell somebody about my faith whether they ask me about it or not they had an unwavering desire to see lost people saved. And were not content simply to show up. And you want to know what that peace probably did for that group of people? It probably strengthened their families probably reinvigorated their marriages. And it probably, from an evangelism standpoint, made them unstoppable. Because they knew that Jesus was the peace for all people and that that peace couldn't be touched or quantified by their bank account by the things of the world. And as a family this morning, both your individual collective families and us as a group, I want to challenge us to survey and ask ourselves this question. Do we have that type of peace? And what does that mean for us? And maybe ask the question, well, maybe I'm not there. Maybe I don't have that type of peace. What can I do practically to have that peace? Well, maybe it's simply praying a prayer, something like this. Lord, thank you so much that when I was weak, you made me strong. That when I was an enemy, you made me a friend. That when I was lost, you allowed me to live. Amen. Maybe that's the way we start our day. Maybe we, we, we look and see that on the basis of the reconciliation and the links that God went to reconcile me to him, maybe that means within our own families and maybe that means within our own spiritual family, there's some groups and some people that need to do some reconciling. Maybe that means somebody at work, you know, we, we sit back and we say, man, I'm not going to reconcile with them until they come to me. Maybe we need to be the ones who go the extra mile, so to speak, so that we can reconcile with people at work or friends. And when they ask, why are you doing this? We say, not because I'm great, not because you're great, but because God is great. And I want you to know that peace. And maybe... In that moment, or those moments, we and other people will experience something that this world needs so desperately. The love and the grace and the mercy is found in this book. Because of Jesus Christ, who is the peace for all people. And this morning, that peace offering is waiting for anyone who wants to accept it. 
this morning as we stand and as we sing.